both Mary and myself have been crying most of the morning, so, uh, so we haven't had much chance to do much else. And that's why I'm a little late, so sorry about that. And also, because I've been crying, in fact, most of the week, <laughs> I haven't had much chance to do any outlines or notes for you this week. And so I'm going to just uh, have to wing everything off the top of my head today which uh, is probably my normal way of doing it. <laughs> and uh, Mary won't be uh, joining us up the front because she's still doing a bit of processing herself. So. Anyway, so uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming along today. And uh, it's lovely to see everyone's smiling face, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we've, we've both been uh, processing a lot of the motions about, uh, well, just uh, it's a wide variety of things actually uh, for myself and Mary and um, <coughs> it sort of began a couple of weeks ago, this whole set of processing which hasn't stopped yet and uh, it, it began when we were in Tasmania, the uh, day after we arrived actually in Tasmania and uh, while we were there, uh, there was a smallish group, about 40 or 50 people, and about probably about half of the group um, were still in that sort of in-between antagonistic and doubting, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Mary was brave enough to sit up the front with me on the second day, um, but the second day, uh, there were a couple of quite angry men uh, projecting a lot of anger at, um, at me and so that of course caused Mary to get into this meltdown phase as well of feeling like uh, not wanting to do that ever again. But uh, in the process it, it uh, has been bringing up lots of emotions for us between each other as well. And I suppose it's applicable to our, our discussion today. Because our discussion today is about sex and sexuality but from the point of view of the injuries that affect us with our sexual lives. And so what I wanted to do today is just focus a lot on the injuries and in particular some relationships that we perhaps haven't thought about between love and sex. And if we can focus everything that we do today on those injuries that happen because of the separation between love and sex. If you think about it, every single sexual injury that you can conceive of at some point gets traced back to the separation between love and sex. And what I want to do today is illustrate that to you. And then I want to talk about how those particular injuries um, can be overcome when, by bringing love back into sex, if you like. And, uh, and how a lot of the injuries then can be overcome. And in fact, all injuries in, in, with regard to sexuality can be overcome by doing that. So that's what I'd like to talk about with you today. Now, the last time we had a sex and sexuality discussion, quite a lot of people, I don't know if you noticed, but about 20, 25 people left. Uh, and I don't think we'll be seeing them back again, to be frank. Um, and the reason why they, uh, they left was the feelings that I had from them was that they were very confronted by my statements about morality. You remember I made quite a number of statements about morality uh, four weeks ago in our sex and sexuality discussion. And morality triggers people on so many levels. For a start, many times, it triggers us on the level that we feel we're being judged. So we feel that we're being judged. And, and some of the worst judgments on this planet occur regarding sexuality, don't they? You think about you know, the judgments of many homosexuals that they've received over their lives. Many of them have been violently judged. So violently that, uh, that in fact, many have been killed for their, for their sexuality. And so, you can see that all the way through religious history too, there's so much judgment about sexuality. You think about what's happened in the churches generally. There's this general idea that if you're sexual, or you have a sexual desire, then you're no longer spiritual. In, even in New Age philosophy, 
there's this general idea that you have to detune from your sexual desire in order to become spiritual. And then there's the opposite thing that often occurs, where we, there's this whole, if you like, thinking that goes along the lines of, you know, you've got to have sex with everyone to actually love everyone. <laughs> and that, that is a concept that, uh, is, I know it sounds funny, but it's a concept that many people have about sexuality, right? And so when we start making statements about what God created as the ideal, obviously often you and I will start feeling like we're being judged. And so my suggestion is when you feel that feeling, go ahead and feel it, but don't just get up and walk out because that feeling is not my judgment of you. That is your judgment of yourself. And if you can allow yourself to sit in that feeling, what will happen is you'll start bringing up some emotions. Now, some of the emotions will be due to the law of compensation. Now, remember we've talked about that in the past, the law of compensation? That's the law that says that whenever you break one of God's laws of love, there's something that happens to your soul that later on will have to be emotionally released. So, for example, if I murder, there's something that happens to my own soul, which when that thing occurs, I'll have to actually now allow at some point in the future the release of that emotion. Now that emotion well, you know, will be this terrible feeling that comes over me of what I've done and the terrible feelings of the consequences of what I've done. And so the law of compensation works that way too with regard to sex and sexuality. There's many things in our lives where we may have done something. This is ringing a bit. Isn't it? There's many things in our lives where we may have done something. I think it's that one. No, it's, it's the one down there. Oh, okay. Which one is it? The second hole. Second hole. So there's many things that... Uh, it's the second hole? First hole. First hole. There's many things that, uh, that we've done. I'm just trying to adjust that so that there's no ringing. Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's many things that we've done in our lives that have been... Um, shall we say things that we're ashamed of? And it's really good if you can allow yourself to go into those things. Because your sexual injuries are very much connected to two emotions. One emotion is anger and the other emotion is shame. So if we can allow ourselves to go into any of those kind of things, it will help us a lot. But firstly, what I would like to do is discuss with you the separation between love and sex that has occurred. Now, many of us view sex as a physiological thing, something that just happens in the physical body. How many of you have in the past had that kind of concept of it just being a physical thing? So how many of you, for instance, males, how many of you feel like, my sexual response is like out of my control, it's just my body reacting <laughs> to this other body I see in front of me. How many of you have felt that way? Like, how many men have felt that way, right? So quite a few. And as a woman, how many times have you condemned that feeling in a man? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we can see that oftentimes what happens is that we, we start to feel that actually sex is a physiological response, a body response, if you like when in reality, it's something far grander than that that we'd like to talk about. So let's look at the main, the main problem that we have today. The main problem we have today is that love doesn't equal sex. Now, many people say, well, love doesn't equal sex, actually. Many of you may feel that, oh, you've had sex in the past without there being love involved. And that's what the problem is. And that's the core issue that we're facing with regard to any discussion about sexuality. Is that often what happens is we involve ourselves in sex that doesn't have love involved in it. Or we say we love without having sex involved in it. And I'm not talking about the love that we have for everyone. I'm talking about the love we have for a partner. How many of you have been in a relationship where you've thought you've loved your partner but have had not been sexually attracted to them? Right? Quite a few? Right. That's because of this separation that occurs between love and sex. And that's why we need to talk about it. The reality is that 
from God's perspective, there is no separation. That's the reality. And we'll talk about how there, there is separation, how separation has occurred. So, the only time that we're actually going to really enjoy sex is when we start to see it that way. <coughs> <coughs> which is a completely different way than what the majority of us look at sex at. Now, let's look at the different types of things that can occur with regard to love and sex. In a relationship, often I will find myself in a quandary with regard to different things. One of those things is love requires two Two transactions, I suppose, you could occur. These are emotional transactions. Love, let's define love as a passionate and desirous longing for the other person. So let's define love as that. Now, for that to occur, there's got to be two things happening. Firstly, there has to be the process of giving. It occurs. So in other words, I have got to, within all of my heart, want or strongly and passionately desire to give to the other person. Does that make sense? Yes. If I passionately desire to give to the other person, then I won't be ever trying to push them away, will I? Because I'm, I'm actually pulling them close to me when I passionately desire to give to them. Love also involves Receive I before E, etc. Receive. <laughs> Receive. All right. So, so in other words, if I if I am blocked with regard to allowing love to enter me from another person, mm -hmm. then obviously I'm not going to feel loved inside of myself. Does that make sense to everyone? So, on one hand, there's my love that I have inside of me. And I can be willing to give that love. So, and if, I, if I, when I say give it, I have a passionate, desiring, longing for the other person. And on top of that, I need to be in a state where I'm ready to receive love. So, all injuries with regard to sex relate to these two problems. Remember, though, that it's two people usually involved. So there's four problems. There's four problems in that. There's myself and there's my partner. I need to have a passionate longing and desire to give to my partner. And I'm not talking about sexually. I'm talking about in every possible way, which would include sexually. Agree? So I have a passionate desire and longing to give my heart, to give my heart, be open and vulnerable to my partner. She obviously, for that transaction to be completed, will need a passionate longing to receive that love from me. Does that make sense? Yes. Because if she wants to block that love, will that love flow between us? It won't, will it? So can you see she needs to have a desire to receive. Now that's one half of the equation. The other half of the equation is she needs to have a passionate, desirous longing to give to me, and I need to have a passionate longing for her love to be received by me. Can you see that's the four, it's now a four-way transaction. So there's two people that need to be healed in giving and receiving in order for love to be equal to sex, in order for, in fact, love to be completed. But often what happens is one of us or both of us are injured in one way. So if you can just picture it from a sharper perspective now, so just imagine We've got, sorry, we've just got two people. In this case, I'm using a heterosexual relationship. So we've got the male and the female. Right? Let's say the female is injured in the sense that she can't trust men. She feels untrusting of men. So anything that a man gives her, she's going to think, mm, I reckon he's got some kind of ulterior motive. Right? How many of you in the past or now even have felt that as women? Like men have got some ulterior motive. What's the ulterior motive, by the way? Alright. 
So if the man loves you, from this from this person's point of view, he wants sex. In other words, he wants something from me in return for this love that he's giving me. Now what that's going to do is cause the woman to feel like, I don't want to give that. Does that make sense? So straight away, he might be giving his love in a pure way, but she will be feeling, if she has that injury inside of her, she feels like, hang on a sec, all he wants is sex. He's just being nice because he wants sex. Right? And that's going to prevent her from receiving this love in an open and vulnerable way. Does that make sense? Now, in the process, do you think she'll want to give love in return? No, because if she has that kind of injury too, what will she think? If she gives him some love, what is he going to want? He wants sex. Right? So she's going to think, no, no, if I, if I love him, if I give him too much, then... You know, I've got to give him sex and I don't want to give him sex. Now, she's got to ask herself, why doesn't she want to give him sex? Like, in a way, doesn't she? Why wouldn't you want to give someone you love anything they want, including sex, if you really had a passionate, desirous longing for them? Can you see there must be an injury driving that emotion? That injury has to come from probably somewhere in her, pre her life with previous partners or childhood or even her life with this partner. But wherever it came from, there's an injury that needs to be healed. Now, I've given you an example of a woman. The man on this side of things could be that he he's just thinking sex, like she thinks, right? And so he's, what's he doing when he's giving her love? Is he really giving her love? No, he's not. And so what's his problem? His problem is that he just wants sex, and the only way to get it is to be loving, in quotation marks, because it's not love, to his partner in order to get it. So that would be his injury, if that's what was going on. But can you see, if we didn't have those injuries, can you see giving sex to each other would be just like any other love-based transaction? Can you see, in fact, that you wouldn't separate sex from love? Can you even see, perhaps, that you would want to have sex with them all the time? Yeah. And perhaps you'd want to have sex with them like 24-7? Yes. <laughs> and that's the state of abundance of the soul, which is having sex 24-7. So you've got to get used to that at some point. <laughs> now, remember I talked about, remember I talked about the soul, right? Remember these, these bodies, these bodies are actually half of souls, are they not? So we've got the male half of the soul, if you like, I might use a different pen. Uh, you've got the male half of the soul, you've got the female half of the soul, which is the true, the true self, right? Now, as these two soul halves join, so obviously now I'm talking about soulmates, right? As the two soul halves come together, step by step by step, they come together, right? And they come together into a soul union state. That means they're unified in every emotion. Can you see that? Remember, what do we keep on saying the soul is? The soul is? Emotions. Desires. Passions. Well, just look, let's look at those three things only for the moment. Imagine, as the soul is coming together, that each one of these halves are coming together in their emotions, in their desires, in their passions. Now, for many of you, you feel that's a very scary state. Because you feel like, who am I then? I'm going to lose my identity in this process. <laughs> is many times. I'm going to lose my control. And yes, you are. That's the whole point of it, is to actually get to a state where all of your desire to control is completely gone. So, in the process of the soul union, what's actually happening is our emotions, desires and passions 
cause there to be no rift between the two halves of the soil. So you can say when we're starting this process, we start off with lots of barriers or rifts or, or between the two halves of the soil. And what's happening as the soil begins to grow together, we're destroying the barriers of separation between the two halves. Now one of the major barriers of separation between the two halves is sex. Because for the majority of us on Earth, we have this injury, which is men are different, you know, men are from Mars, women are from Venus type injury. This injury of separation. Right? When in reality, if we just viewed sex as another transaction of love, what would we feel? Would we feel this barrier? No, we wouldn't. If I have a passionate desire for my partner, and my partner has a passionate desire for me, there will be no time, and I mean no time, where we would feel like not having sex. <coughs> Doesn't that make sense? Yes. Now, for many of you, for me, many of you who've had abuse injuries or something like that in your childhood, for example, that would be one of the most scariest propositions that you could conceive. But in the end, it is the place that God intended the two halves of the soul to be. In this place of union, constant union. Which also means constant sexual union. So I'm not talking... Um, what I'm saying is, there is no separation between sex and love. From God's perspective. But every single injury I have in me about sex is caused by a separation between love and sex. Now let's look at that. Imagine I'm a child and I've been abused by my father. I'm a female, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a girl being abused by her dad. What am I learning about sex and love there? Do I feel loved in that transaction most of the time? No. Do I feel like that person is getting their enjoyment at my painful expense? Yes. Can you see straight away there's now a separation between love and sex? Is the person who's doing that abuse loving? No. Right. Now, if that's the case, then straight away in me there's a whole set of beliefs. If I'm that daughter, there's a whole set of beliefs now that have entered me about sex and love, isn't there? And I will not equate the two as being together anymore, will I? Now, there's a separation between love and sex. So now, you see how, how difficult that becomes later on in my life now. <laughs> I think it's spirits, right? <laughs> but anyway, um, there's a separation between that now. So I've got this separation between love and sex. Now, if I... If I allow this separation to exist in my life for the rest of my life, which many of us do, let's face it, what will happen is that I will go looking for love and being very confused about the sexual side of it. It's the sexual side of love. And that's where most of our injuries result from. You imagine the injuries that are compounded upon in that particular example. Now, it can be just a tiny little thing that we heard from our parent. For example, we might have been masturbating or something when we were little, and a parent comes along and has an re overreaction to that. So they may punish us, or they may just even yell at us, or feel a feeling of disgust towards us even. They might not even say anything, but actually just feel a feeling of disgust towards us, which we will absorb, will we not? A child, a child absorbs these emotions. Now, if that feeling of disgust now gets absorbed in me, straight away, what am I going to feel about masturbation? That is bad, disgusting, you know, not acceptable. What am I going to feel about my own sexual desire? Shame, guilt. Now, you, can you see how that's going to colour a lot of my adult life if I don't let go of that one emotion? It's going to cover, uh, colour a lot of my adult sexual life. Alright, so can you see how important it is for us to start joining together this love equals sex thing instead of thinking them as two separate things? They are not two separate things. 
the sexual side of your relationship is a complete reflection of the love side of your relationship. So I'll say that again. The sexual side of your relationship is a complete reflection of the love side of your relationship. Now, let's illustrate that. Let's say we've got these two people. This time I'll just draw them literal because I need to write a bit in between them. So we've got these two people. Now, let's say one of them has this feeling. And the feeling is towards the other. I'm really angry with you about something. So, let's say um, it doesn't even have to be about sex. So it might be just about, you know, the toothpaste thing in the morning. It could be just something real simple. Or we could go even a bit bigger than that. It might be something about not being listened to or validated. So let's say, let's say the man, in this illustration, does not listen. Doesn't listen to the feelings. of the woman in this case. So let's say that's just the problem in, this, in the example I'm giving. So what is she going to feel? Every time she opens her mouth, um, words come out. <laughs> but they don't seem to enter the guy at all, do they? It's like just like water at the duck's back, it seems. Now what's she going to feel after a day of this, or two days of this, or a week of this, or a month of this? Sorry? She's going to feel devalued, unappreciated, unappreciated disrespected, unseen, unheard. <coughs> yeah, unseen, unheard, all those things. Now, these emotions, if she doesn't release them, those emotions are going to build up in her, are they not? And they are definitely going to affect her sexual response. Now, many of you ladies have been in this situation, haven't you? where he wants sex, you don't feel like having sex because he doesn't notice you anywhere else. He doesn't notice you in other places of your life. He just wants the sex. Right? Now, what, is, what would his issue be there, do you think? He doesn't want to listen to her. What would his issue be, do you think? He might be overpowered by her. She may, he may feel she's just talking too much. Yeah. <laughs> let's go. But let's go deeper into childhood stuff. He's not able to be with his own feelings. Sorry. He's not able to be with his own feelings. All right. He doesn't want to feel his own feelings. If he doesn't want to feel her feelings, he doesn't want to feel his own feelings, for sure. And why wouldn't he want to feel his own feelings? Because of the injuries that he has, right? So he might feel pain if he feels those feelings. What else? And now if it's particularly with a woman that he's not listening to, does he listen to a man? Yeah, it works. he seems to listen to a man fine, right? <laughs> so, so therefore the injury is probably with his mother. So the, what has the mother taught him? The mother has taught him what? Do you think? If he doesn't want to listen to his mother, what would cause you to get into that transaction with your mother where you don't want to listen to her? Not good enough. Not, mum's always, yeah, not good enough. I'm always useless, I'm always bad, never gonna be never gonna make mum happy. What other emotions might be there? What's the point? Yeah, so they're the subsequent emotions generally. What's the point of listening to it? And then it just translates into what's the point of listening to a woman? Doesn't it? Into the after that. And so he may have that injury to work his way through. Now, what will happen is this woman, this woman will no longer want sex. So sex is a no-no. <laughs> right? So he is no longer getting any. What's his first temptation in that situation? Anger, manipulation, why? What's he feeling now? Rejection. Rejection, isn't he? He's feeling rejected sexually. Right? So what's he equating? I know, 
So he's now feeling he's no good at it. So now what is he feeling? Angry, upset. He doesn't want to tune into the underlying emotions, which are all about his mother. But I didn't deal with that. And then if he did that, he would listen, which would fix this problem, wouldn't it? She would feel listened to, validated, and so forth. And once that's occurred, then there's a whole, the whole opening up of herself sexually will occur as well. Can you see how the actual, her feeling like having no sex actually triggers his causal emotion? Which is like, which would be an anger with women emotion. Can you see that? And he needs to go deeper than that. He needs to go deeper than that into his sadness and despair that he has. Jet? Um, he had gotten these feelings from his father as well. Oh, certainly. Had a lot of anger with women. Certainly, he could have got these feelings from his father. Yeah, certainly. His father doesn't treat the mother very well, and he's learning that from the father. Certainly. He could have got it from his father. In the example I've given, he got it from his mother. But <coughs> he just wanted to know whether it was that. Certainly. Remember, all of your emotional injuries, including your sexual ones, come from both parents. So, so that and that and often, if the mother is a acting a certain way or behaving a certain way, the father will often, often, often be acting in the, the attractive, the empathetic attraction that occurs through the soul attraction in the opposite way, typically. So, yep, definitely. Now, can you see in, this, in that case that her no longer desiring sex is totally emotional, isn't it? Okay, now, for, for you ladies, how many times have you felt that? Like where, where you're in a certain emotion and that's the reason why you don't want sex. But for the majority of people, it would be the case. Now, if we take that one step further and go down and, and dig down into sexual dysfunction, she might not want sex, but let's say she feels that she can't do that. She will actually start closing down her physical sexual response. So in other words, she will start not orgasming for example, in the sexual transaction. Do you see why? She's actually got this feeling now of anger towards the male and she doesn't any want, want to give him what he wants. Right? And what's the thing he's trying to take? Her sexual response. That's what he wants. So she will close down her sexual response in return. So many times, you know, we're, look, we're in a relationship and we're actually looking at things from a... Uh, <laughs> sounds like I'm in a, in a water thing now. <laughs> we actually look at things from a very uh, surface layer. So, for example, this woman may not be feeling her anger with the man. And instead of saying to him, no, I'm not giving him sex, she may instead just automatically start closing down her own sexual response. So she gets to a state where she no longer orgasms with this man. And then what does she say? You're no good in bed for the man, or she might blame herself, right, and go into this state of saying, what's wrong with me, I can't orgasm, right? What's wrong with me? In reality, what's the problem? It's always an emotional issue. So, so out of that, it's a lose-lose situation? Yes, if she focuses on the physical side of that response and says, all right, my body's closing down towards you, so I'm no longer attracted to you, she is not being truthful with herself. The truth, the truth of her attraction is she's no longer attracted because this man doesn't listen to her. If this man listened to her, that attraction may just fire up straight after that. Do you follow me? Yeah. Or, and then she would also need to look at her own thing. She attracted this man not listening to her. Yes. Did she not? Yeah. Through the law of attraction. So what emotion in her would cause her to attract this? It has to be something, again, to do with her childhood in reference to a male. Can you see? Yeah, no one listened to her. Maybe no man. How many men are present as fathers in a young girl's life? Like how many fathers are really truly present? How many fathers also worship their daughters, sometimes in preference to their wives? 
I don't mean have sex, want to have sex with them. I mean worship them in the sense of put all these ideals on their daughter and make them into something that they're not. Yeah. How many men, by, when the daughter becomes a teenager, they get angry with the daughter wanting to go out and party and have sex? <laughs> now, if the man's doing that, he has a vested interest in his daughter's sexuality. There's a problem with that. Can you see? There has to be a problem with that. And if there's a problem with that, this woman's going to feel a certain way as she grows older. So the key is, with all of these situations, is to look at them as emotional problems. Now remember, I keep saying that to you over and over about all of these issues that we have in our physical body. Everything is an emotional problem. So we, we've talked about diseases, haven't we, in the past? And I've said every one of them has an emotional cause. We've talked about all sorts of injuries that you can attract in your day to life, day life. Every single one of them has an emotional cause. So therefore, let's look at sexual organs and sexual organ dysfunction. Every single one of them has an emotional cause. This is what we need to face. Every single one has an emotional cause. Now, the key is, and this is why it's uh, so important, in fact, to have a sexual life. Because you don't find the emotional causes unless you have one, generally. Right? So what we need to do is look at, look at what's going on within ourselves emotionally with regard to why we might not want to be involved. So they're always to do with emotions. Now let's look at those four love-based transactions. Firstly, I love my partner. What did I define love as? A passionate, desirous longing for my partner. How many of you feel like you have one of those things for your partner? Right? Some of them, right? So can you see that already there's quite a lot of us that don't have that? Whenever we don't have that, it's because there's an emotional injury in myself that prevents me from having that. That's the thing we've got to first look at. There's an emotional injury in myself. Why am I with a partner that I don't have a passionate, desirous longing for? I might have had a passionate, desirous longing for them when I first began my relationship with them. Why don't I have it now? What's going on? There's got to be something happening at the emotions level for me to not have that. How many of us feel this? Now, let's define love again. A passionate, desirous longing. So my partner has a passionate, desirous longing for me. How many of you feel that? I can't put my hand up there. So. <laughs> How many of you don't feel that? That your partner has a passionate, desirous longing for you? There's a lot not being honest. <laughs> Alright, you're allowed to not be honest here, if that's what you want. It's not going to get you very far. we go back to the beginning. <laughs> if I define love as a passionate, desirous longing, many of us will not feel that for our partner or feel that our partner feels that for ourselves. And they are the crux of all sexual issues. They are also the crux of the majority of our issues with our own self or our gender-based issues, so issues with the opposite gender. So, what we need to do is heal them. What we need to do is heal them. And the sexual relationship exposes them really, really easily. That's the beauty of the sexual relationship. Now, let's look at some of the kinds of things that happen during sex. How many of you feel that your partner does not have as strong a sexual desire for you as you have for them? How many of you feel that? Some of you. Okay. Now, if the partner does not have as strong sexual desire for you as you have for them, what emotions are being created in you? Unwanted. 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 Frustration. Frustration, but let's go under the frustration. Frustration is a capping emotion. That's the anger-based emotion. 
underneath that is unwanted, rejected, rejected unworthy, unloved. sorry, unloved. unloved. They're the emotions that we're not allowing ourselves to deal with at the causal level. Does that make sense? So that's, and in my case, that's exactly the emotions that I'm not allowing myself to deal with at the causal level, which I've been dealing with for the last two weeks, <laughs> trying to. The feelings of being unloved, unwanted, rejected, and so forth. So allow yourself to go into those emotions. Jen? And um, maybe if you just wait for the mic to come around. <laughs> Remember what I said about the two halves of the soul. What's going to happen to the two halves of the soul? They're going to finish up joining together from an emotional perspective, at least. If they're joined at an emotional perspective, will they have the same desire for each other? Do you think? Yes. Yes. In fact, what will happen is the desire of each will pass through the other and it will be like a circular rotation, if you like, of emotions. From a metaphysical point of view, they'd call that energy. <laughs> but I would prefer to call it emotion because love is an emotion. So what will happen? As the desire for each other continues to grow, both parties will feel it unless there is a blockage in one of the parties. So the truth is that these two halves of the soul will feel, in fact, in the end, the same sexual desire for each other at the same intensity, which will be 24 by 7. So, should we be having less sex when there is soul injury that affects our loving nature or our ability to be able to express love? You know, so, like, our, we're not perfected, I'm certainly not, I know I'm not. I've got problems with my expression with love. Should I be having less sex with my partner until I can get that in tune? Or well, I'd like to make lots of rules about how much sex you have. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what I'll do is I'll come and check on you. <laughs> no, Jen, of course not. <laughs> obviously, <laughs> obviously what we want to do instead is we want to we want to allow the sex to reflect what's going on at the love level. So, so what happens if it reflects pain? Well, then it's reflecting what's going on at the love level. There's there's pain at the love level, not at the just the physical sexual level. So because sex is a transaction between the two parties, how do you separate if it's a painful thing? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? If sex is a painful thing, either physically or emotionally, it's because of the separation that's occurred between love and sex. That's, remember, what, what, what's the cause of pain? Any pain? Let's look at, well, let's look at, let's look at what the cause of pain is here. Pain? I've got pain. What's underneath pain? Denial. All pain is caused by the denial of something. The denial of a absolute truth. Underneath the denial is probably some some fear that's preventing me from wanting to even look at anything. Underneath the fear is probably some anger, so you know, or it might be flipped around, the anger first and then the fear. And then underneath that will be some grief of some kind. Right? Which we might layer or cover over with other emotions. Pain is caused by the denial of the deeper stuff. So, if there's sexual pain physically, it's caused by the denial of an emotion that's deeper. If there's emotional pain during the sex act or afterwards, it's caused by the denial of an emotion that's deeper. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, if we can remember that every time... So, let's say we have sex. Let's say your partner just um, is not in the act. Like you don't feel them present in the act. How are you going to feel? Hurt in some way, aren't you? You're going to feel rejected, you're going to feel unloved, and all this. Feel them. Allow yourself to feel those feelings, because the sex just triggered them. The sex isn't the cause of them. 
the cause of them is childhood events where there's been a separation between love and sex. That's what's caused them. What is self-love coming to um, well, it's very important because remember, we can't love another without loving ourselves. So, if the other doesn't deny, if the other doesn't want sex, is it still okay to love yourself? You're allowed to love yourself. Yes. <laughs> what if the other person gets offended by it? Well, that's their problem. That's their emotion. That that's you know, how can a person not want to have sex with you and then say you? do it yourself, if you like, and then they get upset with you for doing that. There's obviously an emotional issue that's triggered all of that. So again, allow these interactions to occur. Like, so if you feel like masturbating and you've got a partner, masturbate as much as you want in front of them if you want. Honestly, that will trigger them. <laughs> will it not? Yes. And you'll start working through some sexual issues. Often the times why we go for masturbation is because we're not feeling loved. You know, and it's a way for us to get through this feeling of not feeling unloved. It's an addiction that it can be can become as a result of that. But allow ourselves, allow everyone around us to see it because that will trigger the emotion. If you do it all in private, you know, cover it all up, and nobody sees it, what happens then? Nobody triggers an emotion, and the emotions all just stay in. Stay inside of the boat. Right. Right. That mic isn't working, is it? No, the is the battery dead, is it? Is there another mic? <laughs> Ram, thanks. Um, I have an underlying problem with pretty much everything you've been saying today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's good. Um, it, it sounds to me like you're talking about that there's two separate sorts of love. That, like, it feels to me like there's only one sort of love. And if love equals sex, um, how do I love my friends and my relatives? <laughs> I, I said at the start, in a relationship. So, in a relationship, why would you not want to be involved with sex? But I have a relationship with my friends. And no, I'm talking about a, the soulmate relationship. I'm talking about the relationship with the unique partner. I have trouble separating them. It just feels like there's just one sort of love, so I'm confused. Well, that's the reason why you have a lot of difficulty with sex, because there is a separation of the two, of the types of love, if you like. For example, I love all of you in the audience. I don't want to have sex with you. <laughs> The person I want to have sex with, she's not here at the moment. <laughs> right? but, but that doesn't stop me from loving you. That type of love is what I would call a brotherly love, a brotherly affection. The type of love we're talking about here with regard to sex is the erotic love, where you have a passionate, desirous longing for one person in the universe. So you are saying there's two separate sorts of love? There's a lots of sorts of love, not just two. The, Greek, the Greeks actually said there were four, but there's a lot more than even four. The Greeks said there was eros, which is erotic love. There was philia, which is brotherly love or brotherly affection. Storge, which is fil filial affection or family affection. And then agape, which you may have heard the term of, which is like a love based on principle. The Greeks sort of said all of that. This is the trouble with the English language, is we're not clearly defining what type of love we're speaking about. In this particular discussion, I'm speaking about erotic love, love based upon a desire, a passionate desire for each other and no others. That's what I'm speaking of. And that is totally different to the love you have for your brothers and sisters, of which everyone here is, because we're all brothers and sisters. Does that make sense, Grant? Now, if you can't separate them, it's because at, child, at some level in your life, there was so much shame attached with erotic love that now you want to only experience the other forms of love. So you are totally comfortable with agape love because I've been with you when you've shown consideration for people you don't even know. That's agape love. And you're totally comfortable with brotherly affection because often when we meet each other you give me a hug and I can feel that love coming from you. So you're totally comfortable with that form of love but you're not comfortable with erotic love. 
and erotic love is a facet of love that's in your soul that needs to be developed. And if you develop it, you'll find lots and lots of different emotions being triggered. And as those emotions get triggered, you're going to find actually that you'll get closer and closer to God in the process. So allow yourself at this stage just to conceive that there is different forms of love, even coming from your own soul. It seems to me that maybe a lot of other people are very confused about this too, and that's why we have things like incest and all that sort of stuff. Exactly, exactly. Most people are very, very confused about love. Most people have got no idea what love is. That's why we need to learn about it. And that's why you think about from the spiritual progression point of view. We draw the spheres quite often, right? In the spirit world, one, two, three, four, five, and so forth. What are they? They are different stages of love. love all right? And different stages of love and the different facets of love are going to be developed in each one of those spheres. The boundary that separates those spheres is a boundary that can only be transcended by love. Does that make sense? So, so in fact, the, your entire development for the rest of your life is going to be totally, totally surrounding this viewpoint of love, development in love. That means developing every single aspect of your love. Now, you are quite well developed in the aspect of agape love because you give to people who you don't even know. Right? You're quite well developed in the aspect of brotherly love. So, brothers and sisters that are here in the audience you feel a strong affection for. You're quite well developed in that love. But erotic love, you've been shut down with right from childhood. And your own spiritual development since then has been focused on shutting that aspect of you down, not on making it blossom. So now there's a lot of confusion surrounding it. So just allow yourself to conceive that there is this aspect of love inside of you that is quite shut down at the moment and that you can develop and you're allowed to develop it. At the moment there's a lot of shame associated with it, guilt associated with it, power and control issues in particular are associated with it and that's what caused the shutdown of that erotic part of yourself, the, the part of what, which we call sexuality. Does that make sense, Graham? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the key is allow your sexual partnership now to start triggering areas of that particular love. Allow it to develop that area of yourself. Because that area of yourself, just like every other area of love in yourself, will need to be developed to a point of perfection to be either happy in the spirit world in the sixth sphere or in the celestial spheres. So either, either path you take, it needs to be developed. <coughs> Yeah, so if you have the loving sex thing, yep. so if, if you've been sexually abused and yep. you become promiscuous, yep. love still equals sex but in a negative way, or you're looking for love. Yeah, see I'm talking about again a definition of love from God's perspective. Love of myself and, and love of the other is going to be totally harmonious. If I'm going to sacrifice love of self to love the other, then I'm no longer loving to both. Right? So it's a very important thing to understand about love. If I sacrifice my love of me in order to love someone else, then I'm no longer loving to myself or the other person. In the case of an abuse victim who then becomes promiscuous, she is using sex to get to become loved, but most of the time the other person in the transaction is not loving towards her. And for herself, she does not feel any love for herself in most cases. And that's why she's wanting sex to feel the love that she doesn't feel for herself. So both, both parts of her are injured. She has this injury with regard to how she feels about self, but also an injury with regard to how she feels about sex being love, is being loved. The truth is that I'm talking about sex equaling love from God's perspective, not the way we look at it here on earth. So many times when a person is involved in a sexual encounter here on earth, they are certainly not being loving. And so in that particular instance, love isn't equal to sex. But why does a person enter into that transaction? It's because there's already a separation inside of themselves, inside of their own belief systems, that love and sex are separate. Does 
that make sense? When there's a belief inside of me, in my soul, when there's a feeling inside of me that love and sex are the same thing, I will never ever enter a sexual encounter where there's not love coming from me or and coming to me. Ever. So all one night stands disappear. Immediately. Because I don't, it, as soon as I have that viewpoint inside of me, I can't even get an erection in a one night stand, let alone actually consummate it. Do you follow me if I'm a male? If I had that belief? talking about God's perspective of love, not the man's perspective of love. So the example Angie um, is bringing up is that there was this lady I know who, who had sex with her father until she was 15. And then she lived with her father until she was 26. Right? She felt, well, at the time I had this discussion with her, she felt no animosity at all towards her father. So she'd been in this transaction with her father, which was sexual for the majority of her life. And I, I know of another lady, actually, who had seven children by her father. Uh, and, and a policewoman who visited her house because she was also getting physically abused by him, and wanted her to press charges, and she refused to press charges. And every one of the children were her father's. So what's the issue there? What's been distorted in both cases? She's denying herself. First up, let's look at him. Let's look at the man. What's he doing? Abuse. He's, he's abusing her, his daughter, in the name of love. Right? And that's exactly what these two men said. That oh, I'm just loving my daughter. Right? Now, what's that? There's a lot of distortions there. I'm not saying that love is equal to sex. I'm saying inside of him, love and sex have been separated. Because if he loved her, he would never consider sexually abusing her in the first place. Agreed? Yeah. So inside of him, inside of that man, right at that instance, love and sex are separate. He views sex as a separate transaction to what love really is. And he has no understanding of love. If he understood love, he would never ever abuse her in the first place. And he would never put love and sex together in that way. Right? The truth is, because it's separate in him, he can get into this sexual transaction with his daughter right? and be totally, totally detuned from how much he's damaging his daughter. Totally detuned. And if he's totally detuned from how much damage he's doing, is he loving his daughter? No. So the truth is, inside of that man, love and sex are like two polar opposites in him. And uh, he's, been, he's got some major injuries with regard to love and sex. He doesn't view them as the same thing. He doesn't view them as, if I loved this girl, I could never force her into this situation. So what he's doing is he's actually saying, no, I want my sexual urges fulfilled and blow the love of her, blow what she feels blow her shame and all the other emotions that she has, I'm not interested in any of those. And that's a very selfish act. And that's not what I'm promoting, uh, obviously. If he actually had a belief inside of him that love is sex, sex is love, he would actually feel that, like, hang a sec, love would never allow me to harm my daughter. Even if I had a thought to have sex with her, I need to deal with this thought. If that's how far he would go. He wouldn't ever touch her. But because he hasn't got that, because he's got them separated in his mind, in his heart he's got them separate, he now thinks he can have sex with her and it doesn't matter because it doesn't, he is not considering her. If that makes sense. Um, <laughs> If I have a belief inside of myself, a feeling, an emotion inside of myself, that any sexual encounter 
must be loving to myself and to the party involved. If I have that feeling inside of myself, I would never be involved in any sexual abuse, sexually abusive conduct. Can you see that? I would never, if I was a male, I would never rape. I would never be involved in child abuse, would I? If I felt that inside of myself. But if I see, if I feel that power is sex, which is a totally different relationship, I may do those things. So can you see it's the distortion of love that creates the injury? It's the distortion of the truth that creates the injury. About loving the self, so if we came out in a Yep. But we have a partner and you have love, you know, have sex often. Mm -hmm. Is it, are we trying to get, so you're not having that love yourself, are we trying to get that love from them to validate our own self-love? Yes. And if that is, is that what you call loving with a condition? Yes. And that's no good? No. That's going to create pain to one or both of you. And if you think of relationships where you've been in that transaction, usually they do create pain to one or both of you, don't they? So if I'm entering a sexual relationship with a person because, for me, I believe that if they have sex to, with me, they'll love me, the reality is that I'm needy for l love. So therefore, what's going on inside of me? Do I actually really love myself? No because I'm needing another person to validate the love of myself. This is my main problem that I'm working through. Right? If I need the love of another person, the sexual desire of another person to love myself, then I'm out of harmony with love. Straight away. Um, you know, I was, I just wanted to say um, that, do you feel that all love is conditional? No one in that state until they're at one with God. Yeah, so, so we're working towards that state. So obviously we're all works in progress. <laughs> well, no, that, no, don't use that then as an excuse for conditions. Do you see what I'm saying? Don't, don't then choose to hold on to your conditions. Because what we've got to do is break down the barriers of these conditions. The only way we do that is by presenting to you the ideal and then we work through breaking the barriers that we have towards that ideal. So the ideal is yes, I will have a passionate, desirous longing for my mate, and it doesn't matter how she feels about me, who she's off with, what else she's doing, I will still have a passionate, desirous longing for my mate. And I won't feel offended, and I won't feel angry that she wants to have sex with someone else, I won't feel afraid, I won't feel any of those other emotions. That's a pretty powerful state to be in, isn't it? Yes. Now, if you're in that state, do you think the other person might be attracted to that state? Yes. Very much so. So that can cause a lot of attraction. The problem is, is that we often have this thing of not loving ourselves in the transaction. So this is the area that I'm, that's my major issue still. And that is of not loving myself in the transaction with my partner. So what, what I need to do is start to look at why I'm not loving myself, what actions I'm doing to not love myself, and I need to get underneath all of those. Instead of placing conditions on my partner to love me while I'm working through those issues. And if the, if the, the law of attraction will be working perfectly anyway. So if I have that feeling in me, there's a high likelihood my partner will not be giving me the things that I feel I want from them anyway. Which causes the disharmony in me to grow which hopefully triggers the underlying causal emotion that I feel. And the irony is, is once I feel that underlying causal emotion, my partner will probably finish up loving me. And if not that partner, certainly the person who's my soulmate or someone else will be attracted to me and love me in that manner. 
So don't place conditions. Yes, all of us do have conditions on love as we're growing. But that's the problem, you know, as we're growing through the spheres. The reason why we're growing through the spheres is because the lower sphere has the highest conditions. Right? And then as we grow from there, right, what we're doing is removing the conditions. But don't think about the conditions and validate your conditions. What I'm suggesting is look at the ideal and then see yourself truly as God sees you. And then allow yourself to work through the emotions as to why you have conditions. Does that make sense? Yes. And just wait for the mic to come here. Thanks. What's the difference between uh, you loving your partner and loving yourself? Because you have sexual relations with both, but you can't be doing that 24 7 with your partner when you're doing it with yourself. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Obviously, um, the love of your partner involves, there's two people involved in this transaction, not one anymore. The whole idea, like, so when you get to the soul union state, you will never masturbate. Yeah. <laughs> Do you understand? <laughs> not there. So on, on earth, you can get into a soul union state. Right? So I'm saying on earth you can get into a soul union state where the two of you are joined together as a soul. In that state, each of you will never masturbate. Why would you need to? Like, if your emotions are passing through them and their emotions are passing through you, it's an automatic... And I don't mean masturbate when you're during a sex act or something. I mean by yourself. I mean having sex by yourself. Because both of your emotions will be in union. All of your emotions, including your sexual emotions, will be in union. So that means that you'll be actually feeling them at the same time as the other person. Right? So there will be no transaction, in fact, that will be by yourself. So even just masturbation, for example, in the sex act, that is a separation of this ideal condition. Now, I'm not saying you can't masturbate, because of course you can. If you can't touch yourself, then nobody else should be allowed to touch you, including your partner. Agree? So, so what, I've got, what I am saying is that as you grow in your sexual desire for each other, the desire for release of some kind, which is usually tagged into other emotions that need to be healed, will diminish over the, over the same time. So you actually get to the point when you desire your soulmate in a complete way, even if you're not with her, you will probably not masturbate again. So is masturbating actually hurting yourself? No. It's getting a sexual release without it's some sort of sexual emotional release. It is an emotional release, but it just depends on what emotions you're dealing with and how you're dealing with them. If you're using masturbation to deny an emotion within you, in other words, if you're using masturbation to run away from being unloved, then that is hurting yourself. But if you're using masturbation to trigger that emotion, then you're no longer hurting yourself. Can you see the difference? Yeah. yeah. So, so with all of these things to do with sexuality, we can use sexual, sexual things with ourselves or our partner in order to work through the issue emotionally, or we can use them as a denial tool to run away. Now, sex is one of the biggest denial tools that the mankind has. You have to agree with that, right? How many times do we, like, it's like eating. How many times do you go out and get some food when you feel an emotion? Like, for most people, there's a big link between those two things. It's the same for many others with regard to sex. There's a huge link between the desire for sex and the denial of emotion. The key is to use the sexual act to access the emotion. So like, after you masturbate, do you feel sad? If you feel sad, then it's because there's an emotion of unloved, unwanted, I have to do it to myself, nobody else wants to do it to me, all those kind of things, right? That are inside of you. Allow yourself to access those emotions now, feel those. When you masturbate, do you feel shame? Well, if you feel shame, then the same thing applies. Go into the emotion. How does it, you know, how does that emotion feel? Feel the heap of shame pass through you. You know, when you masturbate, do you think of your mother? <laughs> Some people do. Yes. Right? So straight away. <laughs> What's that? I didn't, I didn't get that. You've got to repeat it. I said the queen. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever turns us on. 
was on it. <laughs> In that kind of situation. <laughs> So in that kind of situation though, there's an attachment between sex and my mother that I have not healed. Does that make sense? Or in that case, the queen. <laughs> Might be a feeling of power. But whatever it is, whatever we're thinking of or feeling associated with the sex, that is linking us to the emotion that's unhealed. This is why sex can be such a powerful tool for you to use. <laughs> but, uh, uh. <laughs> to, to actually access the emotions that we're denying within ourselves. It was also a very, very powerful tool to deny the emotions inside of yourself. And this is why many people, and particular men, have a habit of actually using sex as a tool of denial. So my suggestion is not to do that, but to actually use sex as a way of accessing the emotion. So when it gets back to your question about masturbation, if, you, if you're loving yourself to the exclusion of your partner, then you're no longer loving yourself or your partner. There's got to be an emotion inside of yourself that is driving that action. Allow yourself to feel that emotion, whatever that is. Discuss that emotion with your partner if you've got one. If you're, if you're by yourself and you're masturbating, well, that's a different matter. You're obviously not yet connected to the soul part of love. But that's fine, you're allowed to not be, we're all works in progress. You, you follow me? Yeah. But allow yourself to look at the emotion inside of that. What's the emotion? What drives it? What fantasies are being fueled or fueling that desire to masturbate? Allow yourself to look at those fantasies, allow yourself to feel them. They'll all be linked to injuries, usually, within your past. Allow yourself to access them. Allow yourself to be sexual and access these emotions. Because they are all emotions that need to be healed. The truth is, in the pristine state, and none of us are there, but when we get to the state of that's from something, when we get to the state of at one moment with our soulmate, what will happen is I will never have a sexual desire that she cannot feel, or that isn't in the same intensity that she hasn't. And that's a wonderful place to be. And that's the ideal. And all we're doing is working towards that ideal. So allow sex to be a method, just like there's other methods of working towards that idea. Does that make sense? Does that help with that question? Yeah, just kind of more of another one though. Oh, fire away. In different types of uh, sexual transactions, are they all what you call sex, or is it just the uh, intercourse that you... No, like oral sex, anal sex, uh, like normal, normal heterosexual sex, there's obviously sex between homosexual couples, all of them are sexual interactions. From a soul-based perspective, what's actually happening is there is an, a sexual, the, ero the feeling of erotic love is passing from one party to the other party. And it actually, take, it actually changes the soul of the other party. It actually, if, it, if, it's, if it's happening at the soul level, it's changing both of your souls as it's happening. So all of those things are sexual interactions. So I would classify all of those as sex. Oh, okay. Yep. <coughs> I got two questions. One, one is if I was at a one with God on Earth currently, and there's never been, and there's never been a soul union ship there, would that information is fair to say that no one's actually made love? From God's perspective? Yeah. So that, that brings a lot of hope to your relationships, doesn't it? If you're having good sex already, imagine what a one-minute sex is like. So, you know, it's like every aspect of your life. You'll find when you become a one with God and then progress even further to the one-minute with your soulmate phase, what will happen is there'll be so much... Well, after you've gotten rid of many of the emotional injuries, that, that's the drag. The hard time is the time you're working through now. So many of you are going through pretty hard emotions, pretty harsh emotions, feeling really quite down at times, working through different things. This is the hard period of your progression because we're releasing all of the errors about love. But once you get to the point where there's no more errors about love, from then on, all you're learning is new truths. 
and that process is just a blissful and beautiful process. And when you get to the state of the soul union, at that state you are now having sex at the intensity that God actually intended you to have it. And all the things that happened before then are all just leading to that state. And when, when you actually make love, if you wanted to have a child, that child would have no emotional interest. Spot on. Imagine that. Wow. Like, imagine, you, like, you feel, most of you here can feel how much trauma you're going through now, yeah. if you're following anything I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're going through a lot of trauma, right? Yeah. In terms of emotional trauma. These are all old emotional traumas that you were, you were actually feeling because we didn't feel it at the time that we meant to have felt it, which was at the time it happened. So what we're doing is we're releasing all of these traumas. That process is a very, that is the most difficult process of this entire path, right? Because all the estimates are really easy because it's all about love. It's all about learning lessons in love and every new lesson in love is just joy. And then imagine when you're in this state of a union where there's no emotional injuries within you, having a child in that state and the gift that you can give to that child, just of no injuries. So they will never ever experience what we're experiencing. Imagine that. It's just an amazing place. Now they'll be at a six fear condition because they are not, they may, maybe not yet received divine love and maybe they haven't had a longing for it yet. But even in that space, it's a fantastic place to be without the injury. And you wouldn't, if you came in six sphere position, you wouldn't, you'd never go below, would you? Well, um, you could be influenced by the world around you to go below. And certainly people in the past have. So Ammon and Amman, the first human couple, that's what, what actually happened. They were influenced by desires that were negative within themselves that they allowed to develop within themselves that caused them to step down below the six sphere condition. So it's possible. It's highly unlikely if you're enjoying the state to want to go below it. Yeah. And in the spirit world, when you go below it, you're also going, you can't any longer, if it happened, and it's never happened, but you can't any longer access the beautiful place where, that you had just before. So, so my, everyone in the spirit world would never even consider doing it. And in the end, what will happen is here on earth, people on earth won't ever even consider doing it. At the moment, we've got a lot of external influences, a lot of spirit influences that are depressive, that cause us to consider doing it quite easily. And, and also, as a human species, the urge to procreate, have sex, or to eat, are you saying that underlying that is all emotional stuff? The urge to procreate without love, the urge to just have sex without love, is all emotional injuries. The, in the end, what will happen to you is you'll you find, even when you get into the atonement with God phase, which is not the atonement with your soulmate phase, but just the atonement with God phase, you will no longer desire a sexual transaction with anyone other than your soulmate, and you won't desire a sexual transaction even with your soulmate if it's unloving towards yourself or towards them. So, so in that place, you think of the majority of sexual crime just gone <laughs> completely because of being in that space. So that space is possible here on Earth too, where, where you're in that place. And most of our desire for sexual interactions on Earth today are based around injuries rather than love. They're based around a need to feel loved, which is an injury, right? Or the need to actually be loved, and the need to not be rejected, the need for touch, all sorts of needs that we have, many of them are based around injuries from our childhood that we wouldn't have if we didn't have those injuries at childhood. Thanks. Um, Peter, maybe? I wanted to ask, what are the, uh, the qualities and attributes of, uh, of love that you need to master as you move through the spheres? Because there'd be, there'd be specific uh, lessons in love that you'd have to realise as you progressed. And I can answer that question, but it's really irrelevant for life on Earth. And the reason why it's irrelevant is you, you can learn any lesson of love here on Earth um, at any time, and you don't have to be in a certain location. The reason why spirits learn certain lessons of love at certain times is because they're told they can't get to the next sphere unless they learn that lesson. But the truth is, here on Earth, 
you're obviously going to be in this surroundings anyway. You can learn any lesson from any sphere. And many of the lessons that I've presented in the, in the natural love discussion are lessons in love that, that are higher level lessons in love, like fifth year or sixth year lessons that you can learn here on Earth at any time. So I don't think there's much point in having a discussion based on that unless I was talking just to a group of spirits. And even then, I don't feel there's much point because that, group, that spirit, the spirits in those groups, would already have been told from their spirit friends what the lessons are that they need to learn. They're just probably not connecting to them. So it is it important to know what those lessons are uh, in, in our desire to um, experience those while we're alive? Well, the beauty of receiving divine love is you automatically learn the lessons without having to know them intellectually. So your desire to know them intellectually is about, is about not allowing yourself firstly to connect to God and just feel them. So as God's love enters you, you will automatically start learning the lessons in love, automatically, without needing to be taught them. And that's one of the major benefits of on the divine love path, is you automatically learn things. Now, when you don't, when you refuse to learn on the divine path, there's always pain. So if you're in pain right now, you receive some divine love and you're in pain, the reason why is there's a lesson in love that you're refusing to accept that there is a truth of already around you or inside of you. And the key is to allow yourself to accept it. So, for example, one lesson of love might be, I will not demand anything of somebody else. When I receive divine love, I feel this feeling inside of me that I don't want to demand anything of anyone else. But if I break that, if I actually refuse to acknowledge that feeling within me and decide I want to force somebody else to do what I want, I will have broken the lesson of love and there will be an automatically painful experience that I'll experience as a result of breaking that lesson. Whenever you do anything that's disharmonious with divine love, pain automatically occurs when, as soon as you do the thing in disharmony. And that's one of what people sometimes call the drawbacks of the divine love path is that if you receive divine love and then you do not or you refuse to act in harmony with the love that's within there will be a penalty painful penalty inside of you as a result of that so allow yourself instead of worrying about the intellectual lessons to actually receive divine love and allow the divine love to dictate to you what you should do and you'll only do that by staying connected with your emotions as you do that so as I receive divine love, I might have a real realization, wow, I haven't been very loving in this transaction. And then you'll say, oh, not just in that transaction, but every transaction like it that I've had through my life. And once you have that feeling pass through you, the next instant will be, I never want to involve myself in one of those transactions again, no matter what the pressure, no matter how much somebody tries to badger me into it, no matter how much somebody tries to pressure me into it, I will never be able to do that thing again. So let's say that thing happens to be just telling the truth. So the third sphere lesson in love, I must tell the truth all the time. That doesn't mean just uh, tell the truth, say the truth. It means I must feel my truth and express it all the time. So that's that's one lesson in love on the third sphere. So once I've learned that lesson in love, and somebody comes up and says, oh, you know, three years ago, did you have sex with that lady over there? <laughs> like an embarrassing moment comes up. <laughs> what will you do? If you've learned that lesson in love, you will say, yes, I did. If that's what happened. If that's not what happened, you'll say, no, I didn't. And then the tax office comes to you and did you say, oh, did you lie on, in 2002 to the tax department? Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> because you've learned that lesson in truth, right? And you cannot break it now. If that lesson has become a lesson in your heart, you can't break it now. You can't break it with anybody and you won't. You won't even want to. The instant you break it, it will hurt and you will feel the pain of it. That's the beauty of receiving divine love. The natural love part, you've got to try and make it happen, make it happen, make it happen. 
Right. What was the lesson again? Oh, it's a lesson of truth. Oh, should I do it in this situation? I don't know. I think I can get away with it. Not doing it. <laughs> That's the kind of thing we do on the natural life path. On the divine life path, you will never do that. Once you've learned that lesson of truth, you will never, ever, ever, ever be unloving to yourself or to another in that way of not speaking truth or feeling your own truth. Even getting down to things like, here I, here I am feeling my emotions. If I'm feeling my emotions and a person walks in the door and I stop feeling my emotions, am I in truth? Right at that point, no, I'm not. If I've learned that lesson in love from the third sphere, I will actually continue crying if that's what I was doing before the person walked in the door. Because right? that's the truth of my feeling. And I will let myself express it. And it's a lesson of love towards myself. Can everyone see that? Like, this is the beauty of the divine love. It transforms your soul so you don't have to think about things. They just happen automatically. But you have to stay true to them. That's your choice. That's your free will. To stay true to them. Um, this is hard to formulate. So <coughs> if I could just say a few things and then attempt to get to the question. Sure. Uh, like this, the symptom may, may show up in um, you feel that um, your partner is is being loving in a sense to you mm -hmm. and is is doing things for you but in an out of balance way so if the um, the, the origin of the, of the love that you experience, if, if everything's going well, mm -hmm. arises from a very deep level, and it seems that it must flow through you and be extended to your partner. Mm -hmm. And if the... You've talked about skipping before. It seems that there can be, like, skipping through you and that there needs to be... Um, a strong feeling of self-love at that time so that you you are desiring for you to have a very good experience and then that be extended to your partner as well as part of the transaction so that so that let's go back to your original down. statement yeah. what, what did you say originally the, the, sometimes you have a feeling that that your partner is doing something for you yes. which seems loving yes but you're not feeling that it might not be loving because you're feeling that it might not be loving yeah. because they seem to be doing too much for you or they seem to be... They're sort of leaving themselves out to some extent. Okay. very good point. <coughs> so, so here's our souls here of our partner. The partner is doing something that seems like love to me, but the feeling that I have is, hang on a sec, I feel she's actually not being loving to herself doing this for me. It's not quite like that, I tell you. It's, um... Well, shall we cover that one first, then? Okay. <laughs> and then you tell me the one that, <laughs> that it is like. I'm not saying this is what it's like in your situation. I'm just saying that this is a transaction that often it has occurred. If I'm in a state where I've received divine love, when somebody tries to do something for me that I feel they're actually not doing it for 